Welcome to Impact Duty. I'm your host, Manisha Dadlani Kriplani, bringing you empowering stories of friends and people I admire. Their voices have given me joy and the momentum to share their stories with you. Sapna Bhavnani is a unique soul in so many ways. Her many hats include being a celebrity hairstylist, filmmaker and director, writer, actress and reality show participant. Mad or What was her trademark hair salon in Mumbai. Recently, she launched a production house, Wench Films, focusing on all types of entertainment, ads, web series, short features and documentaries, with the hope of empowering men and women in film creation. Sindustan, her significant documentary, highlights the Sindhi diaspora and their migration post-partition. Hi, Stapna. Welcome to Impact UT. I'm so delighted to have you on. I'm so delighted to have you here on this platform. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And, you know, it's just been, it's just wonderful to reach out and kind of uh, meet people uh, from different backgrounds and countries, even though you share the same heritage. But right. in a way, it's still like you bring such a different perspective, you know. For sure. So I really uh, appreciate you actually even wanting to have this chat with me. So thank you. Oh, yippee. And how have you been and how has the quarantine period been for you in Mumbai? I think the quarantine has been... Not too good, really, uh, for us in Bombay. Uh, we started mm-hmm. in mid-March. Right. And actually, when the quarantine started, I was pretty active in volunteering. So it's not like I sat at home for the whole quarantine. Uh-huh. I was volunteering till June, like the first week of June, just right. with the migrant workers and going out there. And, um, you know, it was a citizen-led sort of uh, thing that we had called Khana Chahiye. So oh. a lot of citizens came together and came up with this initiative where we crowdsourced money and we were um, feeding migrants. Uh, So it was a wonderful thing. Uh, It was actually more hectic than having my real job (laughs) during COVID. So we were quite busy. Yeah, yeah. But I think that um, you didn't kind of realize that you would kind of be affected just like they, you know, like migrants Mm -hmm. were affected. Yeah, um, like uh, my business was really affected. A lot of small businesses were really affected. Um, right. The government here, I think they were trying to follow Western ways of mm-hmm. lockdown and not really mm-hmm. having uh, any benefits for small business mm-hmm. owners uh, to kind of empower the employees as well. Um, right. So a lot of small businesses have shut down. A lot really? of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been quite bad on the economy, uh, having no plan. There's yes. no plan, really. Uh, we don't really have unemployment or any other business, any other um, kind of facilities like that to mm-hmm. empower us as well. So right. like while my friends were getting paid money to sit at home in America and in Europe, in Canada, yeah. Yeah. but in India, you are just, I'm sorry, you're just out of luck, you know, yeah. just deal with it. It was like that. Yeah. And So you said personally and professionally, it has, this quarantine period has affected you. Um, I'm going to take you and draw you in um, to talk a little bit more about uh, Mad or What, which is your entity as uh, a hairstylist. Um, How has it affected Mad or What? So Mad or What got really badly affected. Uh, It's been coming for a while though. I think like, with demonetization, it was a really big hit for our industry to begin with. Really? Um, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people all of a sudden didn't have any money uh, to spend. Um, then after that came GST, which was a really big deal because everything went up with GST. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So not only like, okay, so I'm going to pay so much money, but then on top of that, extra money with this GST on everything, right? You pay GST. Everyone in the country pays GST. Uh, right. Uh, so it was a really big thing. And now with the COVID thing, uh, with my uh, salon, I took a conscious decision at the moment to shut it down. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like uh, it was a really big stress on me with the high expenses, with the salaries and the rent. It was just too much for me to handle. Plus also, 
I feel in the last two years I've been so geared towards filmmaking that the the salon anyways was a really big expense for me that I have to kind of come up with every month, you know. Right. So I was taking less clients for me um, mm-hmm. in a way. So I just felt like for now, I would just want to not have this burden on top of me. Yes. Um, Sindhustan is already online, but I just got a new feature that I'm working on, which is an edit at the moment. So Wonderful. it was a good decision not to have this thing looming over my head, you know. Totally, totally. I'm going yeah. to take you back um, to uh, the early days of being um, a hairdresser to moving to yeah. being the hairstylist, creating hair <laughs> art and having an admirable portfolio of celebrity clients. Tell us about that journey. How did you make it? You know, I wish I, I, I really didn't have a plan. I think that has been my biggest strength and my biggest weakness uh, because I'm so impromptu and uh, in the moment. And uh-huh. I just feel like if something feels right, you should just go for it. But right. I'm also realizing that's cool. But a little bit of business planning <laughs> is not a bad idea. Uh, right. But I'm not a planner. Uh-huh. So maybe I needed to kind of partner with someone who can kind of do the planning for me and I just be the creative person. Uh-huh. I think that this, this would be, be ideal for me today. So I'm right. learning from my mistakes as well. But uh-huh. I started matter what without any plan. It was just oh, really? because I did not like wearing a uniform. And the place I was working at was going to make us wear t-shirts with their name on them. And I just felt being in a creative field where you express yourself, uh-huh. wearing a uniform just kills that. So right. just because the you know rebellious personality that I was, I left that job and started my own salon with no uniforms ever and right. I kind of stuck to that yeah 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 so everyone was free to explore their identity um, and be themselves as stylists um, uh-huh. and I must say that you know we actually did manage to kind of create different identities for ourselves usually even in a salon you tend to look like everyone looks the same right. even the stylists start looking the same right you know but for some reason, uh, you know, we managed to have our individual sense of style and none of the stylists kind of looked the same. My hair was not the same. Our way of dressing was not the same. So wow. I think that was a really big compliment to achieve that. And not only that, to be a women salon mm-hmm. uh, it was something that I was very proud of. I didn't start off with that thing in mind, uh-huh. but somehow it just became a very empowered place and a woman run place and a woman uh, driven place for 16 years yeah 16 years wow and what was your big break what was what was it that actually turned you into being uh, the place that people went to get their hair styled or to have the hair transformation what was that turning for you what was the breakthrough I think it was because we focused so much on being the individual Mm -hmm. Uh, instead of a factory line and I think also we are probably the only salon in the world that never sold hair products so you didn't yeah we don't sell hair products so you didn't come to us and pay for a haircut and then pay so much extra money to buy all these products that maybe you would never use (laughs) you know so uh, I didn't really tie up with any brand and we did not sell hair products ever Wonderful. So you were free to, yeah, we just focused on our skill uh-huh. and we just believed in, uh, my motto was always, if you spend more than five minutes or, on your hair on a daily basis, then you need to get a job or a life, whichever <laughs> is easy <laughs> for you, you know? So that being my motto, I think it attracted a lot of free spirit uh, people mm-hmm. who also did not want to spend more than five minutes on their hair every day. Bravo. Bravo. Yeah, wash and go hair. That was our thing. Wonderful. Wonderful. And as we know, you have released a documentary called Sindhustan. Okay. Um, And um, that is especially essential at the moment as we broach the upcoming Independence Day, the 73rd 
um, Independence Day um, with the creation of two nations, uh, India and Pakistan, yes. uh, a partition that led to a migration that was probably the largest migration um, in history. Yes. Um, yes. And uh, you've given the Sindhi diaspora um, a new take, a new perspective with this documentary. So I'm going to take us to the documentary and allow you to share um, how this actually was conceptualized, how this moved from concept to creation. Yeah, I mean, uh, the concept, it's been 10 years since that has happened. Um, I was at this, yeah, I was actually going to see a friend of mine perform Shushila Raman. Uh -huh. And there were these Sin Fakirs that came to perform. Nice. And uh, they were the, the Bitsha singers, actually. And when I saw them perform, I was just so blown away because I didn't relate Sindhi culture to this at all. Because what you see in Bombay is not even really Sindhi culture. I mean, I had, mm -hmm. I mean, I was so naive that I didn't even know that there was a, a Muslim Sindhi because I'd never seen one, you know? Totally. So, totally. Uh, yeah, when I saw these guys, I was so blown away. I ran home and just Google Sin for the first time. I'm like, what's going on? And uh, when I found out that Abida Parveen was uh, a Sindhi Sufi singer, yes, it really blew me away because this, my whole life, I'm such a big fan of hers. I always considered her as a Pakistani Sufi singer. Exactly. But when exactly. I found out that, wait a second, she is a Sindhi Sufi singer, it put it in such perspective for me. And I just thought that I had to start, you know, kind of start this process of finding out more about my culture. Wow. So that is what started it for me. Uh -huh. After that, it took me maybe um, two, three years to just figure out, okay, now I knew that, but how do I tell the story, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I didn't want to use Google facts because that's really boring. Yes. If you can Google and find out, what's the point of watching this documentary, you know? Mm -hmm. So I knew I didn't want to touch on those. And also I didn't want to make it a very historical thing because the younger generation switches off when you throw right. so much information and it was right. not going to be an informative documentary i knew that as well it mm -hmm. was it had to be about stories you know mm -hmm. stories you don't hear on on you don't kind of find out on google right and um, so after just you know a few years of figuring out how i want to tell this story um it was this conversation that i'd had with my grandmother that i remembered uh -huh. Which was when I, yeah, when I lived in America, right. I actually lived there for 14 years and I had been very tattooed. And when I'd come back to visit India, I was like trying to cover myself while meeting my grandmother, you know, for lunch. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, she just looked at me and she was just like, she called me old fashioned. And I just <laughs> looked at her and I was like, what are you, what are you talking about, man? Like you're calling me old fashioned and I'm trying to be this rebellious person. Uh -huh. And she just broke it down so beautifully. And she said that when we came on this planet, you know, before we had these countries and boundaries and we just all lived as tribes, not just Sindhis. In general, she was talking about humans. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in these tribes, we all had our markings, which kind of signified where we belong. Right. And so she was right. looking at my markings and she just said, you know, I see you're going back to our roots. And that oh, makes me very happy, you know. Oh, bl so how wonderful. That, yeah. So that's how I decided I was going to tell the story uh, through ink. Right. And it was going to be very relevant. Whoever I interviewed, they would get a little story on my body on my legs i picked uh -huh. my legs only because legs kind of signify journey uh -huh. and feet kind of signify for me the lack of roots they are also the roots of the human body your feet mm -hmm. they take you oh, everywhere uh -huh. yeah so that's how everything just came into place you know 
Wonderful. And I'm actually going to go in and focus a little bit on your tattoos, because like you said, they're not just symbolic tattoos. They're actual body art that tell a story or many stories. So would you like to tell us a little bit more about something somewhere, a significant uh, body art that you created, um, a story that? Yeah, sure. Um, yes. I mean, um, um, I created, so Sindh, I, it was very deliberately done. Uh, one like was going to be the sin the journey and the other leg is India and the journey here but really? on the sin side also I have uh, yeah I have Shikarpur where my, my family comes from and so it kind of goes down to Karachi and from Karachi we took a boat like a lot of Sindhis did and they came into the port of uh, Bombay through that that's right so it was really significant um, and if you see the film it's all throughout the film their story is unfolding on my legs. Oh, you know. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. I'm actually, my face is not there in the film at all. Uh huh. Yes, I've seen the film. You're right. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. 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 It's just, I just chose not to become the focal point of the film and let the legs do the talking. Right. I mean, it's a significant documentary. So I really do hope um, a lot of people get the opportunity to see this. It's thank a it's a beautiful so work of art. So uh, thank you my so fingers much. are cro crossed that a lot more people get to see this. Yeah, and if you said, can, I don't know if you can or not, but if you can put a link out there, that would be really good too. Like if people want to see it, you can see I it on Movie so. Saints. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, that would be, that would really help us out as indie right. filmmakers um, who have funded their own films. It's just been a great experience. Uh -huh. uh, never really made this film for profit uh, mm -hmm. it was more about the community uh, but the point being is that it would be nice to make up the money put in it <laughs> you know? oh, for sure, and, for sure. Uh, there, there are lots of other projects though now that I see myself doing when it comes to sin mm -hmm. this was just the conversation starter right but the goal is a bigger goal uh, that I have um, for the community and also for the website kind of to become like the one place for everyone to meet, uh, exchange ideas, to have mm -hmm. recipes, uh, a lot of, give a, a lot of chance to maybe the other Cindy directors to oh, yeah. do oh. some stuff to put up on the website. So I have really big plans for the community, uh -huh. uh, one step at a time, you know. Right. So maybe we start crowdsourcing for that. That's the goal. Wonderful. Sapna, wonderful. Yeah. And um, going back to the documentary, um, were there any stumbling blocks in the creation? Because it isn't always uh, easy to access footage uh, from across the border. Um, so were there stumbling blocks in uh, the creation of Sindhustan um, or any other stumbling blocks in uh, launching Sindhustan um, as a documentary? Um, of course, there were a lot of stumbling blocks because I didn't get a visa to go there. Right. And I tried for a visa, but... I didn't get a visa to go there, but I was very determined that I was going to have footage uh, in, in my film from the other side. And right. also when my father was born, it was very important that it's there in the film. So there was this wonderful uh, musician, uh, Sef, uh -huh. major. Uh, he has a band called The Sketches. Right. And he also wanted peace amongst the borders. So I reached out to him and I said, man, it'd be really nice if you do the, the filming for me mm -hmm. since I can't be there. So I met him in Nepal because right. he couldn't come here. I couldn't go there. Right. So Nepal was like the common space that we could meet. Yeah. Yeah. It's not in the documentary, this journey, because uh -huh. it was too much to kind of put, to put in into the and, Yes. Yeah, it's a one hour film and you don't want to put, put make it a hodgepodge also of everything, you know. Right. Uh, so then I met him in Nepal and uh, I showed him the footage that I had. Uh -huh. And then um, obviously he went and he shot for me. Right. So all that footage is my original footage. I didn't buy it. And right. it took one month to upload it from there. And it took another six weeks to download it here. It's been a process, uh, but I can imagine that beautiful footage from Sin that, like, um, my personal footage that I paid for and I own. So it's wonderful. Yeah, brilliant, Sapna, brilliant. And um, yeah. 
we have a shared background of being Cindy. Um, yes, I saw that. And <laughs> I think I think our surnames kind of give it away, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, so, um, so I presume we're both Hindu, Cindy, um, and I guess you you probably also, like you said, had relatives that did uh, the journey down, uh, grandparents who did the journey down to the newly formed India in those days. So we have a shared um, identity. But before you made Sindhistan, did you identify as Cindy in any way? And post yeah. making um, the documentary, were there any important learnings you've made, any salient uh, learnings that you've made uh, from creation, creating this documentary? Oh, yeah, I mean, immense. But also, I'm not just 100% Hindu, uh, Cindy. I uh -huh. am a quarter Good. So Sikh. Oh, uh, my, yeah, yeah, Akali's. Yeah, my, my uh, daddy. Uh -huh. So she was, uh, yeah, so she was um, a Sikh, so I'm not a hundred percent. I love that you English. brought that up. I love that you brought yeah. that up because we tend to a lot forget. of people don't know that, that there are exactly. also Sikh Sindhis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up, you know. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. that, I knew that growing up anyways, but right. I just did not know the... The, the history so much that there were so many of us out there right. but also there are just amazing things I found out while doing this documentary which no history book would have ever taught us um, right also the fact being you know just Sindhustan like right. the film's name uh, I don't want to give it all away uh, no don't you should watch the film because <laughs> it tells you that also the word Sufi I yes. We use that word all over the place, but the explanation of that in the film right. is so wonderful and so well put that it just puts everything in perspective, you know. So I feel like uh, I learned such simple things without really knowing I was learning. Right. And a lot of people who have seen Sindhustan have told me the same way that they learned so much without it being an education class, you know. Right, right. And that was the goal. And the goal is also for the younger generation. It's not really for the people who experience partition mm -hmm. or who know everything about partition. It's for the younger generation who can even get interested in knowing what we went through and then they can yes. Google it and yes. find out more information, you know? Yes. And so the um, audience and is different. Yes. And what is Cindy to one person is... It's a different perspective of Sindhiness to another person. And that's what exactly. I loved. That was what I took away personally from your documentary. The individuality exactly. of what is Sindhiness to each and every one of us. Because like you, like, like you said, a lot of us have now grown up outside Sindh, you know. Yeah. Um, and yeah. we've changed and integrated into the cultures that we've moved um, to the lands that we've moved to. So um, home and Sindhiness is just very individual to, to every one of us. Um, yes. And the other thing that struck me from the documentary was the beautiful use of music. Um, I don't want to give too much away, but if you'd like to just highlight something about the music you used, it had such a lovely impact on me. Go ahead, Sapna. Uh, yeah, because there's this man, Mr. Rupani, who's in the film. Uh -huh, and yes. he's a Sindhi scholar, but his main job is also to keep our music alive. And right. he's so wonderful in his little flat in Thar. He has a studio he has created to encourage musicians to come record Sindhi songs. He just keeps on doing this. So when I went to interview him, there was uh -huh. this whole Sindhi crew sitting there. And right. they were rehearsing to break some Guinness Book of World Records for the most amount of songs sung. I don't, I don't remember the exact details, so I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. Right. But I got to meet all of them and I was so blown away because this Gansham Vaswani, <laughs> he's known as the Jagjit Singh in the Sindhi community, okay? Uh -huh. And here he was like sitting there and I was like, oh wow, can I record you guys? And they said, yes. And I just started recording them and oh, then brilliant. I found this song which I really love, which is Mukhe Chade Vende, Dado Dukhe Ve, which is, if you leave me, you'll be very sad. Yes. And that just became like that anthem in my head. I love that so much. And I've used it in my promo. I've used it in the film. Um, I'm actually just in the talks with someone 
you know, uh, hoping. I want to just put the soundtrack out for everyone to to kind of enjoy because people right. who have, you know, uh, seen the film, the, especially the last rendition of Mast Kalandar that Arijit Datta sang. Everybody wants that, you know. It's right. uh, it was, and so I want to just put it out for people to just enjoy. So I'm in the process of figuring out what's the easiest way. Please enjoy the music. Uh, there's another rendition of Mast Kalandar which never uh-huh. made it in the film. Uh-huh. But there was this uh, Gully Boy MC Altaf, and he oh. rapped it for me. Yeah, this is before Gully Boy the film came out also. Right. So he was not Gully Boy then. He was just yes. MC Altaf then. Now he is Gully Boy MC Altaf. <laughs> but uh, uh, so I want to put that rendition out as well. Right. So I'm just gonna see maybe I can edit and make some music videos and put it out, or oh, just wonderful. put it out put it out as songs and even uh, you know uh, all these songs that I have recorded and there's some wonderful songs recorded on live from the sin side right well. right so I just want to put that music out because music is Lovely. such a huge part of our heritage exactly and such yeah. a form of connectivity as well yes yeah. yes music connects Completely. Mm-hmm. And it was the reason I started this documentary to begin with. That's it was right. music. Yes, yes, you mentioned. Yeah. And yeah. Sapna, you are a woman who's donned many feathers in your caps. Okay, in your cap. Um, you've uh, written for important publications in India. You have dabbled with acting. Um, and uh, you've created some music videos. And I recently found out you were a participant on a reality show. Okay, oh, so yeah. I'm going to ask you uh, to highlight one or two of those feathers in your cap and tell us what's next on the cards for Sapna. Uh, man, I mean, <clears throat> at the moment I'm working on my uh, feature. So yes. it's an edit. Okay. It's got nothing to do, it's nothing like Sindhustan. It's the complete opposite of it because I am not just one thing myself. I am right. many things. And I just launched my uh, production house called Wench Films. Ooh. And I picked Wench because I did a survey on Twitter and asked people, can you name some derogatory terms for women that are not swear words? I mean, yeah. swear words are the obvious words. Yes. But what are some other words, you know? So, of course, I had uh, people telling me there was spinster, there was hussy, there was wench. In Hindi, there was kalmui, uh, kali kaloti. You know, there were all these words that were coming up and I was like, wow. So, I didn't want to pick a Hindi word because I just wanted to relate on a global platform. Mm-hmm. But to me, wench really stood out because right. it's a catchy name. And I just thought that uh, having a... Uh, a woman having a production house called Wench Films would be great. And my tagline was also shaping perspectives. So it's also something that, uh, you know, uh, even with Wench, how you see it differently or the kind of films I want to make will kind of shape your perspective in a way. So that is my goal. And also to push feline talent. Oh, I brilliant. feel from India on an indie platform, uh, we women are very... Um, you know, uh, a minority. We're right. not represented enough. So already I've been talking to a lot of women directors. I'm seven of them on board already. And I've not made official announcements yet because I, I will do that soon. Wow. Uh, I feel like I want to pitch. Yeah, so not, to, not just in the ad zone, even right. in the web series, uh, filmmaking, I want women to be more out there. I mean, in the uh, commercial Hindi, there are a lot of women directors that yes. you know of. Yes. But on the indie space, there aren't. Um, in the ad world, I've been shooting ads for the last 15 years and I've only worked with four women directors. Really? That's shameful. Yeah. Right. That's really bad. Yeah. Wow. So we want to change that a little bit. I'm not looking saying forward. that it's only women. I mean, that's, yes. I'm not saying that I want to represent only women. It's male and female. But I do want to push women in areas where women are not pushed. And it's mainly a, a man's game. So I want to Wonderful. kind of change that shaping perspectives, like I said. You know. Wonderful. So that's the goal. I'm Good very excited luck, about that. Sapna. 
good luck Thank with creating you. that space and platform. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So that's the, that's the goal. And also I feel um, all this wonderful uh, thing uh, I have with hair. I right. have a really extensive background with hair, makeup, styling, right. uh, even with writing because I used to write for a publication. I'm in the process of writing a book which Harper Collins has been very kind. It's been three years. They've allowed me to write this book for three years. And, um, you know, I told them I'm doing this documentary, so I don't have the uh -huh. space to write. So they've been very patient with me, but now I've gone back to my writing. So it's uh -huh. wonderful that film is a platform that you can use all your skills in. Hair, makeup, styling, writing. All this becomes a film. Right, so I hope my films have the best hair. <laughs> <laughs> they Which definitely they will. will. Yeah. yeah, and when it comes to writing as well, and even with content, uh, playing a lot with different, um, a different eye. So that's uh -huh. the goal. And I feel my next, my new film, which is in edit right now, called uh, "My Dog Is Sick" or "Mera Kutta Bimar Hai," will have wow. that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wonderful. Sapna, it's been an absolute delight speaking with you. I've learned so much. And you really are somebody who's uh, got many, many feathers in your cap. So may the stars keep shining bright for you. And oh, I'm looking so forward kind. to you. <laughs> I'm looking forward to your new adventures and your new ventures. I'm looking forward to it all. Ventures. Ventures. <laughs> <laughs> yes, not the singular, the plural. Okay. Yes. Take care, Thank Sapna. You so much. It was and so nice, really, to have this chat with you, Manisha. Thank you so much. Care. Take care. Bye.